Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. My father was a very good man and a great father. He was always so understanding of the strange events that happened to me and us while I was growing up and even into adult life. The reason for this was that he, too, experienced strange things and had done so since he was a boy. In fact, his mother was a medium, and my dad plainly had inherited some of the gift and carried it like an unwanted burden through his life. Unfortunately, Dad was a strong and quiet man, so he never told me much about his own experiences. But every now and then, perhaps over a pint, if he was in the right mood, he would mention one or two things that had occurred. His memories begin with being a small boy and seeing his mother have many visitors. Eventually, his mother told him and his brother that she was a medium and people would visit her to contact their dead relatives. He never said what he felt about that, but I can imagine it must have perturbed him at least a little bit. One day, he told me his mother started to tell her two young boys a little bit about being a medium. She told them that she had a spirit guide who worked through her and, if they wished, they could meet him. Overcoming any trepidation, my dad said yes, he would like to meet his mother's guide. What happened next, though, was so unexpected and so shocking for a young mind that he remembered it vividly all of his life. His mother closed her eyes and began to breathe deeply and rhythmically for a while. He and his brother watched as her face and features slowly began to change. The eyes began to slant. A long and thin mustache and beard started to grow. Her hair began to straighten and skin color changed. In just a few moments, the two deeply horrified boys were looking not at their mother, but at an old Chinese man who smiled back at them from where their mother's face had been. One can imagine the fear and shock of this. Where was their mother? And who was this Chinese man? I know that it deeply disturbed him and that he had nightmares about it. I asked him why his mother did this, and he said that he thought she just genuinely wanted them to see there was nothing to be afraid of and hadn't realized how the boys would react. Anyway, it must have been a deeply traumatic experience for him. Throughout his life, Dad plainly saw and heard things that others did not. Periodically, he would wake up shouting and pushing some unseen thing away. When I asked him about this, he told me they were dark shadows and that was all he would ever tell me. 
Undoubtedly, he heard and saw some of the things that I did growing up, as he simply accepted what was going on and tried to help me. It was my dad who told me one time that in his experience, getting angry worked. What he meant by this was that whatever these things were, they seemed to get stronger the more scared you were. They fed off the fear energy that they caused, and it was this energy that attracted them. He told me, get angry, swear, and shout at them if needs be, but be angry. Don't let them feed off your fear. He was right. The strategy always worked, since in some way the anger overcame the fear and they lost their energy source. However, getting angry while a good temporary strategy isn't a long-term solution. The long-term solution required inner work. It requires a strong mind and will and the determination to not allow these things into your world at all. I come from Serbia and am now living in Sweden. All my life, I have been a fan of Elvis, so I had a big Elvis Presley poster on my door. It had been there for about two years, and one evening the poster fell down on the floor. I hung it up again. It fell down again. I cleaned the door and hung it up again, and it still fell down. I did the same about ten times. The last time I threw it in the basket and went to bed. The first thing I heard on the radio the next morning was that Elvis died in his home, the same evening when my poster fell to the floor. It was a December night and I couldn't fall asleep. I have a younger sister who was already fast asleep in the other room. I felt cold hands tickle my feet. I said, Angela, thinking it was my sister. I put my feet quickly under the covers and turned over, not thinking anything about it. Moments later, I felt something get into bed with me, and they put their hand over my hand. I also felt their stomach going up and down against my back. When I turned over to see what my sister was doing up, nothing was there. I freaked out and screamed. I woke up my whole family. My uncle came into my room and asked me what's the matter, and I told him what happened. I slept with the lights on for the whole week. Then, a couple nights ago, I was about to fall asleep, and I heard my door open and little giggles then someone tapping on my shoulder. No one was there a second time. I was so scared. This episode of Weird Darkness is brought to you by the audiobook The Midnight Diet Club by Mark Newhouse, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Some kids would risk almost anything to be thin, popular, and stop others from teasing them. But would you join the Midnight Diet Club? Esme is an overweight teen girl who was hounded endlessly by three sinister bullies. In her quest to find acceptance, she almost loses her soul in this funny, slightly scary twist on Vampire Legends. Winner of first prize in the Florida Writers Association Royal Palm Literary Awards for Young Adult Fiction, published 2011 under the previous title, You Never See Fat Vampires. The Midnight Diet Club, available now on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com, or click the link in the show's description. The story I want to relay to you is one that I will never forget as long as I live. Let me start by giving you a bit of background. 
The house I grew up in was haunted, and I still live there. It has gotten better, but there are still moments when I get creeped out. This story was probably the most strange one. I was 11 years old at the time. One night while sleeping, I suddenly was awakened by a presence in the room. I awoke without opening my eyes first and was scared to do so because I knew something else was in the room with me. At the time, I was lying on my stomach with my face right at the edge of my bed. I finally got enough courage to open my eyes, but when I did, I was terrified by what I saw. No more than a few inches from my face was a miniature Greedo. For those of you who don't know who Greedo is, he was the alien from Star Wars that Han Solo killed in the bar. My mind raced to comprehend this strange green thing before me. It stood about three feet tall, and I could make out its every feature, its big globe eyes, its little ear things, and its long, snouty nose, which was just inches from my face. I stared at it just long enough to try and comprehend what I was seeing, and then I slammed my eyes shut. I prayed like never before for God to make it go away. I was sweating heavily and petrified with fear. Determined to get as far from this thing as possible, I ever so slowly inched myself toward the wall over the course of the next hour. I finally must have fallen back asleep because I remember having a dream that I woke up with my head now facing the wall and there were some pictures hanging crooked there. I reached up to straighten them and that's when Greedo grabbed me in my dream. I immediately woke up and it was still dark and I was now facing the wall as I had dreamed. I heard my dad getting ready for work and this gave me new courage to confront Greedo if it was still in the room. I jumped up quickly on my bed and swung around to face it. It was gone. I immediately ran into my mom's room in hysterics and told her what had happened. I refused to sleep in my room for a full month after that. When I was 11, we moved. It was a good move, to be honest, from a terraced three up, two down in West Hall to a rather nice semi-detached outside of Hall. It meant a better school and a nicer environment back then. It stretched my parents' finances a bit too. It is funny though that my brothers and I really did not like that house the first time we saw it. It had terrible wallpapers, it was gloomy and ill-lit, very cold and damp without central heating. Between the three of us, there was no excitement at moving there. Of course, within a few months, that house was completely different. Central heating had been installed, old fireplaces blocked up and replaced with modern gas fires, new wallpaper and decor and new curtains. To make it seem more homely, a couple of internal windows had been added, letting much more light enter into the rooms as well. It was transformed. All was well in the household. But it wasn't to stay that way. It started with the noises. Strange noises at all times of day, but mostly in the dead of night. Scraping sounds and scratching sounds. Dad put it down to maybe a squirrel in the loft. I wasn't as convinced. Things would also move around. I would place my watch by the bathroom sink to get washed and find it in the kitchen. At first, I thought it was Dad having fun as he was always a great practical joker. But it soon became apparent that it was not him. Keys went missing. Money, too. These would then just as mysteriously turn up in the strangest places like on a window ledge or under the sofa cushions. The next developments, though, were what eventually had me relieved to leave and go to college. It was what kept me awake at night in total fear. Have you noticed that silence is loud? I mean, when you are really, really focused on listening to nothing, 
It is very, very loud. I would lie in bed, head under the bedclothes, bedside light on, and listen. The scratting sounds, scratching sounds, and the sounds of doors opening that I knew were locked. The sounds of footsteps and breathing. It was enough to make the hair stand up on the back of your neck. I would actually dread coming home from college for a weekend or the summer because of this. By the way, this only happened when I was there. Just for me, apparently. I would literally go out and get drunk to stay there. The best example was one night close to Christmas. I was home from college and had been out with my friend and had a few. I was sleeping on the floor in my brother's room that night. I lay down hoping to pass right out, but instead, I was cold stone sober and scared half to death by the sound of the front door opening. Now, the first thing I thought was that somehow I had left the door unlocked, but I knew that wasn't the case as I had checked it on the way up the stairs. The key was in the lock and that door was locked. The front door opened and closed as I listened to sitting half up in bed. There was a deep sigh and a little cough. Ice-cold fear ran through my veins. The silence was so loud it was unbearable. Then the first footstep and creak of the bottom stair. My heart was beating as if to burst. Another long sigh and another step and another I was now fumbling for the light, but my hands were shaking so hard I couldn't find it. By now, the steps seemed to be at the top of the stair and moving along the hallway. The floorboards creaked, and there was that sigh again. I was frozen to the spot, but what I actually wanted to do was run. Run anywhere. There was a moment's silence, and then I watched in disbelief and horror as the bedroom door began to slowly swing open. I screamed, I screamed so loud you probably heard me in London. A few moments passed by, and then the door flew open, and there, to my utter relief, stood my dad in his pajamas holding a very large spanner in one hand and a flashlight in the other. He switched in the light, and my brother looked about him in a state of shock through two sleepy-looking eyes. It's okay. I heard that too, said my dad. I heard it too. We sat, dad and I and my brother, for quite a while, but all was quiet. Whatever it was, it had gone. I eventually fell asleep, and my dad went back to bed, checking the doors in the process. We didn't talk much about it the next day. It was simply something that happened in that house when I was home. My dad said it was poltergeist activity and it was centered around me. I think he was right. We didn't really know what to do about it, but we did discover one thing. If I got angry, the phenomena stopped. So that is what I would do. I would get angry and shout at whatever it was to get lost, or perhaps using even more choice phrases. If a door started to open, instead of screaming, I pulled the door open with a verbal challenge. It had the desired effect. The onset of my paranormal experiences started early in my life, but increased in intensity and severity when I reached the age of 15. At least twice a week when I was in bed asleep, I'd be woken up by the sound of footsteps approaching the bed. Pretending to be asleep and peeking out from under half-closed eyelids, I'd see a bulky shadow standing at the foot of the bed. I could tell by the stature of the shadow that it was a male, My body would be stiff with fear as he advanced, approaching the side of the bed nearest my head. He would lean over, and while pressing his hands down on my chest, he would put his face directly over mine. As he did, I'd tightly squeeze my eyes shut. 
I could feel each breath that he took on my skin, and as he exhaled, the hair on my head moved. He would place both his hands around my throat and choked me. Overwhelmed with terror, I would hysterically scream for help, and he would immediately vanish. I was terrified of sleeping alone. His attacks were frequent and never stopped. They just changed. As time progressed and years passed, his interactions with me were no longer just limited to nighttime, but started occurring during the day also. His boldest endeavor by far is his ability to shapeshift, once imitating my cat who has since passed. She was a gorgeous black Persian named Spook, and she used to sleep with me every night, jumping up at the foot of the bed, walking to the head of the bed and snuggling with me. It was her nightly ritual. This one night in particular, she bounced upon the bed, still awake, I rolled over onto my left side and started petting her. Warm to the touch and purring heavily, she obviously enjoyed the attention she was receiving. Suddenly, something quite disturbing happened at the foot of the bed. All the hair in my arms stood up. Something small jumped up onto the bed with us, and I could feel the mattress respond as it moved towards me. I held my breath and rolled onto my back so I could get a better look at what it was. My brain was trying to comprehend what my eyes were seeing. It was my cat. How was that possible? Quickly sitting up, I glanced over to the cat I had been petting and watched it disappear before my eyes. Laying back down, I cowered under the covers and waited for morning to arrive. This night, like many others, there would be no sleep. The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises, but those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your close-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have, because he's not human. Bigfoot loves our country and you, so much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does, so he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past – absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats, shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Brook Street in the late 1800s counted as one of the most respectable upper-middle-class streets in Louisville. Lined with shade trees and large, unassuming two- and three-story homes, many considered it the prime location for the town's merchants, bookkeepers and business managers, and even the odd lawyer or schoolmaster. As early developers sold off prime slots of land on St. James Court and up and down 3rd and 4th, the desirability of land in the area increased and extended the boundaries of the Derby City's most exclusive neighborhood. Although some of the old Louisville elite may have felt that it had a definite working-class air about it, 
the residents of Brook Street certainly enjoyed a comfortable existence during Louisville's Gilded Age. Victorians in the River City's upper class lived in a time when the influx of river trade and train travel inundated the city with an unprecedented degree of wealth and sophistication. This prosperity showed itself in an overabundance of impressive residential architecture that made Louisville a city famous for its comfortable and elegant homes. In 1909, the Louisville Times of December 31 reflected on the town's self-proclaimed title as the City of Homes in an end-of-the-year article describing national acclaim for her impressive residences. Those who come to Louisville from afar return whence they came with an abiding admiration for the instinct that teaches men and women of Louisville to make the home the paramount interest of their lives. Proportionately to its size, Louisville owns more handsome and livable homes than any other city in this country, and the instinct is still fully alive. Within a matter of 50 years, Louisville had transformed itself from wilderness outpost to a bustling river town, and by the time it reached its centennial in 1892, it had all the trappings of a modern-day American city, from newspapers and the arts to luxury hotels and restaurants, science and industry, Louisville could compete with any town its size or larger in the nation. As industry prospered and generated wealth, the number of affluent families dramatically increased, and as a result, so did the attention paid to social standing and perceptions of good taste and etiquette. Just like its snootier neighbors in the residential core, Brook Street strictly adhered to Victorian custom and female residents observed calling days, certain days of the week when ladies of the house on a particular street would stay home to receive visits from other ladies in the neighborhood. And even if they couldn't afford to keep a whole household staff like their neighbors in the mansions on Millionaire's Row, people on Brook Street enjoyed their domestic help as well. If a butler, maid, and housekeeper couldn't be afforded, a respectable family had to have at least a live-in maid to take care of the most menial chores. Today's residents of Brook Street have long thought their street to be haunted by the ghost of one of these Victorian housemaids, a shadowy figure that appears just after nightfall. She has come to be known as the Phantom of Brook Street. Although actual descriptions of the ghost vary, they all have one thing in common – her clothing, said to be reminiscent of a maid's uniform in the 1800s. Observers have described seeing a young woman in a light gray, long-sleeved dress with a white lace apron and matching bonnet. Most can easily identify her as a maid or some type of servant girl from a foregone time. Witnesses also say she seems to float along the sidewalks at night, usually with her face turned away from the viewers and they almost always hear a long, piercing scream before she vanishes into thin air. Hattie Sullivan lived in a second-floor apartment near the corner of Brook and Oak Streets for many years, and she recalls a very similar scene on one summer evening as she gazed out of the window. Looking down at nothing in particular, with her chin resting in her hands while her elbows rested on the windowsill, she couldn't sleep that night for some reason. I had gone to bed early, about 10, since I had worked late and I was really tired, she explains. But after I had dozed off, I woke with a sudden jolt because I heard someone scream. It was a woman, and it seemed to be a painful, blood-curdling scream. I lay there awake at first, not sure if I had dreamed it or really heard it. I was so riled up that I couldn't sleep, so I got up out of bed and turned on the radio. With soft tunes floating from the AM channel, Hattie walked over to the window where she had a good view of the intersection below and decided to take a look. She saw nothing unusual, just the occasional car or bus driving by, and maybe a college student or two returning home after night classes, but she enjoyed her little corner and what excitement it offered every now and then. Besides, she didn't have a TV, so other than books and the radio, this provided her main form of entertainment when at home. 
I just propped my elbows up on the window ledge like I always did, she explains, and I just started to watch. I wasn't hoping to see anything in particular, just people walking by, neighbors coming and going, stuff like that. It was a really warm night, I remember. It was right after the Derby, and it was one of the first really warm nights we had that spring. I had been there for about 10 or 15 minutes when all of a sudden I got this really strange feeling. I was looking down Brook Street towards downtown, and I noticed some of the street lights had gone out. All I could see was our intersection and then sort of like a dark cave under the tree branches where the rest of the street disappeared. It was like the street just sort of disappeared into blackness. As I was looking down, trying to see how many street lights had gone out, a cool breeze suddenly swept up the street, rustling all the leaves in the trees. It was like a really hot summer day when a storm sneaks up on you and the first indication you get is when the wind turns cold. Hattie says she expected to see rain fall soon, so she lowered the window a bit and pulled her house coat tight around her. I pulled it up under my chin and leaned over against the side of the window, waiting for the rain to come. But nothing happened. Instead, all I saw was this eerie glow coming from under the trees on my side of Brook Street. As I watched, it seemed to get brighter, and all the while the hair was standing up on the back of my neck and the wind was still blowing hard. Then, like out of nowhere, I saw this figure come out of the darkness. As a first reaction, Hattie wanted to retreat back into the safety of her apartment, out of view of whatever walked the street but she seemed glued to the spot, transfixed by what she saw. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see the fireplace mantle on the wall next to me, and I just wanted to run over there and start a fire for some reason, she reports. I don't know why, but I just wanted to go and light a fire. I just felt so cold, and I got such a bad case of goosebumps. Even if she had managed to muster herself from her perch at the window, and make it over to the fireplace, Hattie wouldn't have been able to start a fire anyway, since the flues had been closed up years before that. Nonetheless, she had a large, ornately carved fireplace mantle of maple and oak in her small bedroom, and she liked it because it reminded her that she lived in a house where rich people used to live. This figure I saw looked like a maid that might have worked in one of these houses way back when, she reports. I knew right away I was definitely looking at a maid girl or servant because of her uniform. The dress was sort of plain and gray, but she had on a white apron with lace trim and a frilly bonnet like they used to wear in the 1800s. I couldn't see her hair or anything, but I had the impression that she was white, maybe with darker hair and eyes. And she was short. She just seemed to float out of the dark under the trees surrounded by a strange, hazy yellow glow. I just watched her come down the sidewalk for what seemed like an eternity, but it probably lasted more like 30 or 40 seconds. Then, all of a sudden, she raised her hands to her face, and I heard the same terrible shriek that woke me up before that, and she just disappeared. The wind stopped blowing, and the street lamps came back on, and it was like nothing ever happened. It was nice and warm outside, but I still had goosebumps all over me. Many witnesses to the Brook Street Phantom report the same chilly wind, eerie glow, and sense of longing that accompanied Hattie's sighting. Some even claim that the haunt, forlornly sobbing for some unknown reason and with her face in her hands, has seemingly hovered along the sidewalks of Brook Street. Many have suggested that these sightings involved the ghost of a young maid in search of a house to clean. Joe Grayson, an active member of the Louisville Paranormal Society and native Louisvillian, claims his grandmother, a longtime resident of Brook Street, referred to this ghost as the old maid, although most agree that they get the distinct impression of a very young woman. Charlie Hutchins thinks that people are seeing the spirit of a young woman who used to work in one of the homes that no longer stands on Brook Street. 
a spry octogenarian who has lived his entire life in the old Louisville neighborhood, Charlie can recall references to the Brook Street Phantom from his days as a student at the Old Male High School in the 1920s. He even claims to have seen an apparition that fits the description of a young Victorian housemaid. Although the local school board almost demolished the structure in the mid-1990s, preservationists and neighborhood activists teamed up to save the significant landmark and today it serves as a community center. When Charlie Hutchins attended in the 1920s, Mayo High School had just barely completed its first decade of existence. Back then, he explains, that was the place to go. If you lived downtown, you usually went to Mayo. The location was terrific. During our lunch break or after school let out, we'd head over to 4th Street and hang out. Back then, that's where everyone went. Up until the 1950s and 1960s, 4th Street served as the city's premier entertainment artery, offering locals and visitors alike a wide variety of theaters, clubs, cafes, restaurants, and shops. We'd spend the whole afternoon walking up and down 4th Street, Charlie recollects, just window shopping and watching the girls and swapping stories. Saturdays were the best there, though. I'd get up early, do my chores at home, and then meet my friends in front of the Sealback Hotel, and then we'd just walk up and down the street. The Great Depression had just started, but to see 4th Street back then, you'd never think there were any problems in the country. Everyone seemed happy. During one of these Saturday walks up and down 4th Street, a friend told him the story about the ghost of Brook Street. I don't know if I really believed in spirits and haunts and such, but it was getting close to Halloween and we were making plans to sneak into the cemetery at night, so talk turned to witches and spooks. A classmate, Eddie, told him that a servant had been murdered in one of the houses near the school and that her ghost supposedly walked the halls late at night. Other kids talked about this ghost, but I don't know that I ever believed any of it at that point. As for the story of the girl getting killed in one of the houses, that was something I had heard before too. My dad had told me about that, so I pretty much believed it. Charlie says he became a believer in ghosts not too much longer after he had heard the stories that his friend Eddie had told him. It was the middle of November, and some of us had stayed after school to help the teacher get ready for the upcoming Christmas play. A bunch of guys were in the auditorium putting up decorations, and I had to get some stuff from a storage room down the hall. His arms, full of rolls of green and red streamers, an uneasy feeling suddenly overcame him as he walked alone down the corridor. I looked up and right in front of me I saw this figure or something. It was all white and looked to be a servant girl with an apron and bonnet. I stopped dead in my tracks. She just seemed to stare straight ahead, almost looking right through me. And Then she just started to fade away, and soon there was nothing at all. I ran back to the others and made sure I was never alone in those halls again. Others have had even closer and more unsettling encounters with the ghost on Brook Street. One of them, Louisville native Rhonda Buckman, now lives on the East Coast. As a U of L dental student, she rented an apartment on Brook Street for five years in the early 1980s when in her late 20s. Although she had grown up in that part of town, she had never heard anyone talk about a phantom on Brook Street. My family was very Baptist and very conservative, so ghosts were out of the question for us, she explains. Nonetheless, she could not explain a strange series of events that happened to her while she lived in her Brook Street apartment during her student days. I decided to get this apartment because, number one, the rent was cheap, and number two, it was right down the road from school. Some people thought me foolish for living in this part of town, but it didn't bother me at all. A tall, athletic girl, Rhonda played volleyball and loved to cycle when she had the time. She usually tried to get in a good jog around the neighborhood before it got dark, and before she had to crack the books for her classes the next day. When she needed a break, she liked to walk the several blocks to nearby Fort George on Floyd Street and relax on the solitary park bench in the middle of the small memorial garden. One day I got home after five that afternoon 
after a quick jog over to Fort George in that neighborhood since it was fall it was just getting dark. I had been in the apartment for about two months and I pretty much had established a routine. I'd get home from class around three, take a nap for an hour or so, do stuff around the house, jog for half an hour, come home, shower, fix something to eat, and then start to study. I usually go to bed around two in the morning. It was my second year of school and I was really enjoying myself. I usually had lots of free time on the weekends and I had a great apartment. Although Rhonda's family had lived at a large, modern condominium in the city center, she had grown especially fond of her first-floor apartment in a large three-story mansion on Brook Street. Although it had been divided into three spacious apartments, the hundred-year-old building had belonged to a well-to-do family until the 1930s, when the last member had sold it and moved to Florida for the warmer climate. From the abundance of rich woodwork, gleaming hardwood floors with inlay and elaborate fireplace mantles, the family obviously had spared no expense when building the house. Even though the plain brick facade would never have betrayed its secrets, many considered the interior to be a bit ostentatious at the least. The house also had an impressive grand stairway, an abundance of stained glass and polished brass, and even the maid reputedly enjoyed more than average comfort in her two-room quarters on the third floor. In my kitchen, which was the original kitchen of the house, there's a back stairway that leads straight up to where the servant lived on the third floor. Even though it was blocked off at the top of the stairs and no one could enter the stairs except from my kitchen, I never liked being on those steps. I always got a very strange feeling on those stairs. She had never experienced anything more than an uncomfortable feeling when she opened the door to the back stairway, but other renters had claimed to hear strange noises and sobs coming from that part of the house. I never considered myself superstitious or anything, but I had heard stories that the third floor was haunted. Since I was on the first floor, I tried not to think about it too much, but when I did have to get on the stairs, it did creep me out sometimes. On the night in question, Rhonda had just opened the door to the servant's access stairs when she had the distinct feeling of someone watching her. I kind of used the steps for extra storage because there weren't a lot of closets in the apartment and I needed some clean dish towels I usually kept in a basket on one of the lowest steps. As I opened the door and reached down for a towel, I froze. I could feel someone's eyes on my back and it gave me chicken skin. Not sure of what she should do, she slowly closed the door and straightened up. I wanted to turn around and look, but I knew if I did, I'd see someone. Before she could muster her next thought, she heard a series of taps on the small window over the kitchen sink, and she couldn't help but spin around. I was surprised that there was no one behind me since the feeling I had was so strong, but my heart was still beating a hundred miles a minute. Sometimes people stopped by unexpectedly, so I walked over to the sink and looked out the window, and there was no one there at all. She stopped to think for a minute and wondered if maybe a friend was playing a trick on her, but then remembered that the small window over the kitchen sink had to be at least ten feet off the ground. Like many of the homes in the neighborhood, the house sat on stone foundations that raised the ground floor four or five feet above street level. At first, I was really spooked, but then I just convinced myself that I had imagined someone rapping at that window. I went ahead and made dinner and ate and then cleaned up a bit before going into the living room to study for a couple of hours. I had pretty much forgotten the whole episode. That is, until she walked into the living room and turned on the lights. In front of the fireplace, on the floor in the middle of the room, someone had taken two fireplace pokers and laid them out in the shape of a cross. It felt so strange when I saw that, she recalls. It was like someone punched me in the stomach and knocked the wind out of me. I just gasped for air and ran out of the room. After a couple minutes, I was finally able to pull myself together, and it was then that I realized that I was terrified. She ran to a friend's house a couple of blocks away and brought him back to her apartment, where everything looked fine, except for the pokers that still rested on the floor in the living room. 
I thought that somebody had broken in, but we looked around and couldn't find anything. It was then that my friend told me the story about the ghost on Brook Street. It seems that Rhonda's friend, Tom, had lived on Brook Street most of his life, and he had grown up hearing stories about the Brook Street haunt. When I brought him back to the apartment, explains Rhonda, he tried to convince me that I was imagining things or that someone I know had been in the apartment, but when he saw how scared I was, he started to take me seriously. He didn't really want to tell me anything, but when I pressed him, he gave in and told me what he had heard. According to neighborhood lore, the lost spirit of a young girl still walks up and down the street. Perhaps she worked as a maid in one of the Brook Street residences in the late 1800s and hasn't found her employer's house yet. Tom's grandmother had told him that a woman servant in the late 1880s had been alone in the house and startled two burglars at the fireplace. They attacked her and savagely beat her, and a couple of days later, she died. Ever since then, people on the street have reportedly heard terrible moans and shrieks late at night, and some even claimed to have seen the apparition of a young female in a maid's uniform. Neighbors had also given accounts of strange occurrences in people's homes, and these reports almost always involved ghostly activity around the fireplace. When I heard about the fireplace, my blood turned cold, confides Rhonda. I really started to wonder about the place where I was living. Sensing her uneasiness, her friend offered to spend the night and make sure that nothing bad happened, an offer she quickly accepted. He needed to run home and get a change of clothes, and Rhonda said she would be fine for the five or ten minutes he'd be gone. However, when Tom returned, he found a pale and visibly shaken Rhonda waiting at the front door. Listen! She pointed back towards the kitchen, her hand shaking violently. Loud footsteps could be heard running up and down the stairs at the back of the house. It started right after you left, she explained anxiously. There must be someone in the back stairway. Cautiously, they both made their way to the kitchen and stopped in front of the door that opened onto the servants' stairs. They listened closely as what sounded like a pair of bare feet ran quickly up and down the stairs before starting all over again. We just looked at each other and stared. I was shaking all over, and I could tell that Tom was freaked out too, but he was trying to hide it. After what seemed like an eternity to her, and after she had convinced her male friend that no one could have entered the back stairs other than through her kitchen, he reached out and quickly yanked open the door. The second he opened the door, the footsteps stopped just like that. It sounded sort of like they reached the top of the stair and then just vanished. Standing at the bottom of the steps, the two looked up and into the empty stairwell as a rush of icy air quickly enveloped them. Only a dim 40-watt bulb hanging over the second floor landing lit the gloomy interior, casting long shadows on the outdated wallpaper as it slowly swung back and forth. Rhonda still can't find the words to describe the uneasy sensation that overcame her at the sight of the light fixture gently swaying in the empty stairwell. It was so creepy that I almost fainted, she recalls. Even after her friend had ascended the full two flights of stairs to make certain that the doors to both the second and third floors could not be opened, Rhonda couldn't rid herself of the apprehension that plagued her. We left the apartment right after all the noise on the stairs and I didn't come back for two days. When I finally did come back, I brought two girlfriends along and they stayed over the first night. Although she had calmed down a bit, Rhonda still had doubts about being alone in the apartment after dark. As long as I had people around, it didn't bother me as much. I guess it made me feel better knowing that I had witnesses to whatever strange stuff went on there. She hoped that the running noises on the steps turned out to be a one-night affair, even if her skeptical friends didn't receive the proof they needed to convince them that she hadn't imagined the whole event. However, they too would soon become reluctant witnesses to the ghostly activity playing out in Rhonda's kitchen, no matter how hard she tried to keep them away from the back stairs that night. 
The minute I walked back into the apartment, she recalls, I got that same awful feeling again, and I was sort of expecting something to happen again. We ordered pizza, so we really didn't need to be in the kitchen. The more skeptical of her friends insisted on checking out the servant's stairs for herself, so she made a beeline to the kitchen as soon as they entered the apartment, ran up the steps, and tried to open the two doors that went to the other floors. I told her they were nailed shut, but she had to check for herself. She wouldn't rule out the possibility that someone could have come through from the other side until I convinced her that I had been in the other apartments and seen it with my own eyes. Rhonda remembers that a new wall covered the door to the back stairs on the second floor and that the landlord had built a large set of shelves to cover the entrance on the top story. I had thought of that possibility as well, so before I went back into the apartment, I talked with both of my neighbors and asked if they heard anything strange that night. Neither of the tenants had heard anything that evening. Everything seemed fine, and we ate our pizza, played cards, and watched a little TV. It was a Friday night, and we didn't have to worry about classes the next day, so we also had a couple bottles of wine. We were all feeling pretty good when we stumbled to bed around two that morning. Rhonda remembers showing her friends to the large guest room that adjoined the living room next to hers and then falling fast asleep as soon as her head hit the pillow in her own bed. I was in a very deep sleep, and I usually am a very light sleeper. I guess it was the combination of the wine and the stress from the two days before. I was out like a light. She doesn't remember what woke her, but Rhonda recalls suddenly sitting upright in bed, staring out the door towards the kitchen. She could hear both her friends yelling, the panic in their voices very evident. I shot out of bed and bolted for the kitchen, not really sure what to expect. I was so groggy and out of it, I couldn't even remember where I was. As she ran past the open door to the guest bedroom, she saw one of the girls sitting upright in the bed, a look of bewilderment and fear painted on her face. The large patchwork quilt lay on the floor. Her other friend stood in front of the door to the back stairs and stared down at the doorknob as it slowly turned around and around. I saw that door and the handle going around and around, and then I remembered where I was. It all came back to me, and then I could hear the same steps as someone or something ran up and down the steps. Her friend just stared, her eyes wide in amazement, as the brass knob kept rotating in the same direction. The woman in the other bedroom slowly emerged, the quilt tightly around her body. Hair matted over to one side, it looked like she had just awoken from a very long sleep. I asked what had happened, and she just shook her head and shrugged her shoulders. I could tell she was still half asleep. Rhonda later learned that the two had been fast asleep when someone yanked the large comforter off the bed they shared. They then heard the footsteps coming from the kitchen and something that sounded like laughter. A woman's laughter. I didn't hear anyone laughing, confides Rhonda, but I did hear those footsteps again, that's for certain, the same creepy footsteps. Her friend at the door still had her eyes transfixed on the spinning doorknob when she slowly reached out and took it in her hand. Taking a deep breath, she paused and then pulled the door open without effort. Rhonda says, I told her not to open it, but she went ahead and did it anyway. I was afraid we might actually see something this time. They could see only the dark interior of the stairwell, and then the wicker basket Rhonda normally kept the towels in as it tumbled slowly down the steps and landed upright on the tiled kitchen floor. It was like someone at the top of the stairs threw the basket down at us. We just kept staring at it on the floor, not knowing what to do. Trying to mask her fear, her friend grabbed a flashlight from one of the cupboards and then ran up the stairs. She was convinced that somebody had run up, even when she reached the top and saw that both doors couldn't be opened. I could tell she was upset, but she just didn't want to admit that something strange had just transpired. She's the kind that thinks there has to be a logical explanation for everything. However, they could come up with no plausible explanation for the happenings in the kitchen of the old house on Brook Street. 
nor could they rationalize the sight that awaited them in the living room when they returned to the comforting glare of the TV. Once again, the fireplace pokers lay in the shape of a cross in the middle of the floor. Both my friends turned white when they saw the pokers crossed on the rug, recalls Rhonda. We turned on the television and stayed up all night. They left the next morning and didn't want to come back. For the next two weeks, Rhonda stayed in the apartment off and on, always making sure that she had at least one other person with her at all times. I was still scared, she readily admits. It was bad enough when people were with me and I didn't want to risk it all alone. Besides, my friends wouldn't have let me go back alone anyway. They were pretty concerned, especially when we started to hear the screams. The next Monday night, Rhonda, not able to sleep in spite of her exhausted physical and mental states, lay in bed. Tom and another friend slept soundly in the adjacent guest room. I was just starting to get drowsy when we heard this horrible scream all of a sudden. It sounded like it came from the kitchen, a woman's horrible, painful scream. By the time she ran to the kitchen, the two men had already turned on the lights and waited in front of the closed door to the back stairs. They all heard the same set of feet race quickly up and down the wooden steps. However, this time the footsteps sounded much louder and angrier, almost deliberately so. It sounded like she, or whatever it was, was really angry. The steps just kept getting louder and louder. She was pounding her feet on purpose to let us know she wasn't happy. It eventually got so loud and violent that the girl on the floor above me heard it and came down to see what all the commotion was. Rhonda quickly explained the situation and escorted the other woman to the back of the house and showed her the stairwell. Angry feet still stomped up the steps behind the closed door, and the four individuals gathered there could discern the barely audible moans of someone at the top of the stair, faintly sobbing. Of course, we opened the door again, and like before, there was no one there at all. Even though we had replaced the light bulb from the time before, it was burnt out again, and the two guys had to use a flashlight to see their way to the third story. Unlike the previous disturbances, however, no one hurled the basket at them or set the light to swinging on its chain. The two men did report a spot of icy air at the top landing, and a strange mist-like fog that materialized and hung over the spot for a minute or two before vanishing. They noted a strange scent lingering in the air as well, a sickly sweet floral aroma reminiscent of the orchids and lilies sent for funerals. I just took them at their word, says Rhonda. There was no way at all I was going up those steps. Suddenly, they all jumped and turned around, startled by several loud knocks on the window over the kitchen sink behind them much louder and more violent than the soft taps Rhonda had heard that first night, these raps threatened to shatter the glass pane. Rhonda's friend Tom bolted to the sink, followed by the other man. A bright outdoor floodlight illuminated the small backyard, and at the window the two men could see nothing at all out of the ordinary. Dry leaves over the patch of ground beneath the window lay undisturbed, and an old brick carriage house with weathered gingerbread trim offered no way of escape since a rusty old padlock secured the solitary door that opened onto the backyard. The four of us ended up in the back garden, and it was easy to see that if someone had been there, they would have had a very hard time leaving. The back door into my apartment and the door to the old carriage house are the only two ways to get out. The other two sides are bounded by very high and dense holly hedges with chain link running through them clustered around the moss-covered stone fountain, the small group stood in the middle of the back garden while the men debated the practicality of a return to the apartment. As she pulled the blanket closer around her, Rhonda listened only half-heartedly, her eyes drawn to the small window over the sink that looked into her kitchen. Her skin prickled with nervousness, and the first signs of fall in the chilly air she let her eyes wander up and across the towering black facade of the building and then let her gaze rest on one of the second floor windows. Her eyes slowly focused and she quickly inhaled a long gasp of air. She could discern a vague form standing at the window 
and it seemed to be looking down at them. It looked like the shape of a young girl or a child with a frilly bonnet, but I couldn't really make anything out, she recalls. It was definitely a person, that's for sure, but it looked very one-dimensional, as if I was looking at a sheet of fog or mist. It kind of hovered there and flickered or shimmered. It's very hard to describe. Her startled gasp drew the attention of the others, and they all found themselves staring up at the strange figure in the window. The diaphanous form of a woman in light gray seemed to float in the darkness of the window pane, keeping close watch over the four individuals below. She appeared to lift her hands and cover her face, and then vanished. We just figured that we had experienced yet another strange phenomenon, one of many that week, and I guess we didn't know what to do. We were just going to wait and see, I suppose, but then, all of a sudden, my friend Tom turned completely pale. He was staring up at the window and he was white as a sheet. According to Rhonda, Tom had figured out what it was about that window that had been bothering him. At first, he, just like the rest of us, assumed the window belonged to the apartment on the second floor. But the more he stared at it and went over things in his head, the more he realized that it couldn't be a window to the second floor apartment. Tom had figured out that the window had to be in the same spot as the second floor landing in the back stairway, the servant's stairs. He also recalled that she had seen no windows whatsoever along the back steps leading up from Rhonda's kitchen. The next five or ten minutes seemed to float by, as Rhonda recalls, and every minute has been indelibly etched in her memory. It almost felt like I was in a movie, but watching everything from the outside. When they all realized that the window had to lead somewhere, the small group ran back to the kitchen and then up to the stairs to the small landing on the second story. The sound of feet running up and down the steps had ceased, and the lone bare bulb that hung overhead had not burned out this time. We all stood there, crammed together on the landing and tried to figure out where that window could have been, she explains, but it was obvious that there were no windows in the stairwell. Finally, they started to run their hands over the tattered wallpaper in the hopes of feeling something hidden underneath. In older dwellings, such as this one, property owners often boarded up or otherwise obscured unnecessary or cumbersome interior windows, so they decided to at least try and find something. Rhonda found a small indentation in the wall about four feet off the ground and started to work her fingers through the moldy paper until her index finger hooked a small latch lying flat in a vertical recess. I pulled on it and a section of wallpaper started to tear away as a small door came open a bit. We ripped off all the wallpaper that was covering it and then yanked on the door some more, but it was really hard to open. It must have been years since it was last opened, so it had lost its square and the bottom really scraped against the floor. Three of them managed to heave and pull till the door had cracked wide enough for someone to slide through the opening. Inside, by the light of a flashlight, they discovered a small room, probably used as a cleaning closet or utility room at one time when the original family occupied the house. Although squirrels and pigeons had definitely felt at home there, it seemed that people hadn't used the space for 70 or 80 years. Old mops and brooms still rested against the wall, and soap and cleanser in their original boxes sat on bare wooden shelves. Local newspapers spanning two decades lay in a heap on the floor, the most recent of which gave details about the great loss of life and immeasurable human suffering after the sinking of the Titanic in 1912. Several tattered items of clothing, rendered almost unrecognizable after years of neglect and decay, hung on a wooden peg next to the small window that looked out over the back garden. One appeared to be a shapeless gray smock or tunic. The other was a small white apron, its lace trim still crisp and neat. After that night, Rhonda says the strange activity in her old apartment on Brook Street stopped completely. 
she and her friends heard no more footsteps up and down the back stairs, and they heard no raps at the window. The fireplace pokers stayed put in their stand to the left of the mantel in the living room, and Rhonda never again experienced that uneasy feeling she sometimes had in the kitchen near the back stairs. After we discovered that secret little closet off the landing, all the weird stuff stopped. It was like she wanted us to find that room for some reason. Was she a maid in search of her next assignment? Did a servant really die a tragic death on this street long ago? I don't know. But I do hope she or whatever it was we saw that night in the window is at peace now. Although Rhonda claims that research about that specific house yielded no evidence of foul play or tragedy in its past, I did dig up accounts from city newspapers in 1887 that give some credibility to the notion that the spirit of a young servant girl might haunt Brook Street. On April 21, 1887, a 23-year-old housemaid living in the home of Mr. A. Y. Johnson family at 1522 South Brook, startled two burglars as she came down the stairs into the dining room. Described as a stout, healthy young woman of impeccable reputation, Jenny Bowman had been left in charge of the house that morning while Mrs. Johnson and her children paid nearby relatives a visit. Thinking the residence empty, Albert Turner and William Patterson, two local men, had entered and started searching for valuables when Jenny Bowman startled them. Although she did put up a brave fight, the two criminals attacked her and beat her terribly. A short time later, the Johnson's son returned home to retrieve something his mother had forgotten. Seeing the door was locked, he crawled through a window and saw that the place was a ghastly shambles. He quickly scrambled out and returned with his mother and neighbors, who found pools of blood all over the floor, glass broken, furniture much displaced, and rugs scattered about. Upstairs, they found Jenny Bowman lying on a bed where her attackers had left her, just barely clinging to life. The two doctors attending her, W. O. Roberts and J. S. Haskins, reported shock at the extent and savagery of the young girl's injuries. She had three skull fractures, with her face and features completely disfigured, and fingerprints on her neck. Most disturbing of all were reports that the two criminals had beat her around the head and shoulder with fireplace pokers, and that one of them struck her such a powerful blow to the cranium that it dislodged an eyeball from its socket. Even though she did succumb to her injuries a couple of weeks later, she reportedly had several lucid moments when she was able to give a remarkably accurate description of her attackers. In an ironic turn of fate, she was able to mar the face and seal the doom of one of her assailants, just as he had done to her. In her last act of bravery before losing consciousness, she had grabbed a broken wine goblet and raked it across the face of William Patterson, permanently branding him a killer. With this information to go on, Police soon apprehended the man and his accomplice and took them to the old Jefferson Street Jail to await trial. Louisvillians became so incensed as word and detail of the horrible crime spread that a vicious mob soon formed and tried to storm the gates of the old city jail. Newspapers carried daily updates on the girl's progress and sensational accounts of the search for the killers. Governor Proctor Knott and city authorities became so alarmed at the situation that they had the men moved to Frankfurt to await trial. Within a year, the alleged killers were tried, convicted, and hanged, and Louisville eventually returned to normal after one of its most brutal crimes and worst cases of civil unrest. It was one of the most sensational stories covered by Kentucky newspapers in decades. Today, little remains concerning the tragic story of Jenny Bowman, other than several weeks' worth of newspaper articles and various accounts of the Brook Street Phantom. Although the residence at the time had the address of 1522 South Brook Street, it doesn't pay to go looking to 1522 South Brook Street today for answers. In an effort to deal with the city's massive expansion and keep up with the influx of new homes in its first suburb, Old Louisville, the local government passed an ordinance in 1906 that changed the street numbering system. 
the original house where the crime occurred occupied a spot not too far from Broadway and has long since been demolished. A stretch of I-65 covers that entire block, which, curiously enough, sits directly across from the old male high school. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. If there is one game that most certainly is not a game, it is the Ouija board. I have avoided that board like the plague most of my life. However, one night in my late teens, my friend and I went to visit an ex-teacher of his. Well, actually, we went on the pretext of visiting her, but actually, it was her daughter we really went to see. That really is, as they say, another story. It was quite late by the time we arrived. We had already been for a beer at the pub and then had the idea to visit as we drove home. Their house was a huge home in a well-to-do area outside Hull. It was four stories and must have been well over a hundred years old, a beautiful home. Inside, we were told that the daughters were playing a board game in the kitchen with some friends. One look told me all I needed to know. It was a Ouija board. No, that's not for me, I said immediately. My friend decided to join them, and so I sat next door in the TV lounge with the teacher, and we watched a movie in near silence. I guess about 40 minutes had passed when I heard pandemonium suddenly break loose from next door. The door opened and my friend came running out, through the room, out into the hallway and up the stairs followed by the girls. We were stunned. My friend was streaming tears, sobbing as he ran. For the next five minutes or so, we all chased him around the house. He sobbed and ran. We chased. It was simply bizarre behavior. In the end, it was I who caught him on the stairs. By now, I suspected that someone or something was in control of my friend, and as my arm caught him on the staircase, I said, Come into me. I don't remember much of what happened after that. Apparently, the entity took my invitation to heart and did indeed enter me with the result that I too started running around the house, sobbing, being chased by everyone. After around 30 minutes of this, I woke up at the bottom of the staircase with wet cheeks and a bunch of concerned faces all staring down at me. It would seem that the family thought that their house was haunted by a specific entity, and in the kitchen they had started to try to converse with this entity. Thinking that the conversation was simply one of them playing games with the others, my friend had demanded the entity prove it, with stunning results. Apparently the entity was looking for something that it felt it had lost and was searching the house, crying as it searched. Somehow both my friend and then I had tapped into this and began to exhibit the same behavior. The funny thing is that I do not recall anything of that 30 or so minutes. It is as if I had vacated the premises for that entire time. Though where I went while the entity used my body, I do not know. It only confirmed my suspicions that Ouija boards are best left well alone.
Over the centuries, there have been many reported cases, especially in medieval legend, of sexual hauntings involving two specific types of entities, the incubus, male demon, and the succubus, female demon. The incubus and succubus usually manifest themselves during the nocturnal hours, preying on the victim when they are sleeping, although there have been some cases where females have actually been sexually assaulted whilst fully awake. One such experience was covered in the book and subsequent movie, The Entity. Any female who undergoes an incubus sexual assault will not awaken, although she may experience it in a dream. If she becomes pregnant, the child will grow inside her as any normal child, except that it will possess supernatural powers. Usually, the child grows into a person of evil character or a powerful wizard. According to legend, it is said that the magician Merlin was the result of a physical contact between an incubus and a nun. A succubus is the female version, and she seduces men. According to one legend, the incubus and the succubus were fallen angels. The word incubus is Latin for nightmare. The succubus, in medieval European folklore, a female demon or evil spirit, visits men in their sleep to lie with them in ghostly sexual intercourse. The man who falls victim to a succubus will not awaken, although may experience it whilst in the dream state. The biblical Lilith, the first wife to Adam before Eve, is said to also have been the very first succubus on earth. There is a version of the Lilith myth in every religion in the world. Many of these creatures have different names, such as Merilith or Lilithu, but all of them have one common theme a demon woman, often with wings, who seduces and sometimes murders men, a succubus. Just as is the case with the succubus, there are also many legends about incubi, singular incubus, but these are not to be confused with succubi, which is the plural of succubus. The incubi are said to be fallen angels in Judeo-Christianity who fell to earth because they had sex with mortal women. Since then, incubi have stalked the earth, seducing women in their dreams and impregnating them. The children of incubi are said to grow up to become rapists. An evil person who raped and murdered in real life may pass on, but may not move on to heaven or hell. Instead, they remain on the earth plane as a spiritual being with the same personality as they had in life. They are therefore free to indulge in sexual intercourse with whomever they chose, so it's not surprising that a spirit of such a nature may be called an incubus or a succubus. Many of these themes have been touched upon in books or a number of fantasy online games or even in television. There are many variations of this sexual demonic legend all over the world. For instance, in Zanzibar, an entity known as the Popobawa generally preys on men as they sleep in their beds. In the Chilo, province of Chile, a pathetic little dwarf known as El Troco woos young naive women and then seduces them. In Hungary, a Lidurk is a demonic sexual predator that operates under the cover of darkness and will appear as little more than a wispy apparition or a fiery light. Any one of these two succubi can be blamed for unexpected or unwanted pregnancies, especially in unmarried women, though you could argue that it might just be a convenient fabrication to avoid vicious gossip. Some confuse the incubus with the legendary Old Hag Syndrome, but it is not. The Old Hag episode is usually confined to a feeling of intense pressure on the chest and, as such, not an actual ghostly sexual encounter. Another difference that separates the incubus-succubus experience from the old hag is that the former is not always unpleasant, while the old hag is mostly accompanied by a feeling of death, suffocation, and the horrific feeling of fighting for your life. Because the incubus and succubus are generally experienced during the sleep state or in between it, most experts feel that it is an imaginary experience and not a real one. However, Telling this to the person who has just had this eerily erotic experience, they may find that hard to believe, 
as to them, it feels as real as actual sexual intercourse itself. Nobody can really say for sure that these events are real or imagined, but until you've experienced an actual sexual assault by an incubus or succubus yourself, it's quite hard to form a solid opinion one way or the other. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. <laughs>